Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Jackie Topol, and I'm here with my colleague, Christy Del Coro. We are the co-founders of the Culinary Nutrition Collaborative, and we'll share a little bit more information about who we are in a moment, but we are so happy to have you here with us today for our first workshop in this two-part series, where we'll be learning all about how avocados can support developing healthy nutrition habits from infancy to adulthood. And here are disclosures. Commercial support has been provided by Avocados Love One Today, and the Culinary Nutrition Collaborative does not have any other relevant disclosures. In today's webinar, we'll be focusing on the latest avocado nutrition research for moms, babies, children, and adolescents. And today, Christy and I will be your presenters. We're both registered dietitians and culinary nutritionists. We founded the Culinary Nutrition Collaborative is a platform to offer continuing education that's really culinary focused and translates the nutrition science in the kitchen. We started with our first annual conference in 2017 and have grown to offering primarily virtual events year round to thousands of dietitians and healthcare providers nationwide. We have two annual conferences. We have our Global Cuisine Series, which is a six week program that just wrapped up earlier this month and our culinary nutrition conference where we'll be, that we'll be holding in June. We're also thrilled to collaborate with different brands and speakers to provide dietitians, health professionals, and chefs with innovative programming throughout the year. Now, and here are our learning objectives. We're going to describe key health and nutrition research on avocado consumption as it relates to diet quality and overall intake of important nutrients in adolescents and families. We're going to explain how avocados can support nutritional recommendations for different life stages, including prenatal health and in early childhood through adolescence. And we will list at least three family-friendly friendly culinary tips and recipe ideas that include avocado as a source of important nutrients. And here's what we'll be covering today. We're going to review nutrition and behavior considerations for the following life stages, pregnancy, birth to 24 months, children and adolescents, I want to share practical tips to help empower your patients and clients with confidence to make healthy food choices and cultivate healthy habits and relationships with food. And then we'll be leading a cooking demo to put this information into practice. And lastly, we'll wrap up with some Q&A. So here are the recipes that we're going to be demoing today. I'll be making the avocado, apple, and banana mashup, and Christy will be making the happy avocado berry muffins. And in case you missed it in our email, we'll share the links to the recipes in the chat box. So scientific evidence shows maternal, prenatal nutrition and children, child's nutrition in the first two years of life are critical factors in neurodevelopment and lifelong health. Child and adult health risks, including obesity, hypertension, and type two diabetes may be programmed by nutritional status during this period. And what's more, Children's eating patterns often resemble those of their household, making it important for parents to model healthy eating behaviors and include nutrient-dense foods as a regular part of family mealtime. So we're gonna start by reviewing nutrition considerations for each of these life stages, starting with prenatal nutrition. Nutrition counseling during pregnancy is not only the most effective intervention for improving pregnant women's knowledge and understanding, but it also influences many outcomes related to pregnancy. Knowledge of nutrition can support a healthy pregnancy, support infant brain and body development, help produce nutritious breast milk for baby and for those who are breastfeeding and help decrease the risk for maternal and fetal complications. And despite the importance of nutrition before and during pregnancy, Many moms may not be getting adequate information around healthy eating patterns during this life stage, or may not have access to or know to ask about nutrition. Overall, US adults are known to have low intakes of folate, potassium, fiber, and vitamins A, C, D, and E. This was also found to be true in a national survey of pregnant women that was reported in the 2020 Dietary Guidelines Advisory Committee report. Recommended intakes of folate, potassium, and vitamins A, C, and E are greater during pregnancy and when lactating compared to other life stages. In the image on the screen, you can see that on average, women who are pregnant or lactating are falling short on recommended intakes of vegetables, fruit, slightly, and dairy. Fruits and vegetables provide, as you know, potassium, vitamin C, and folate. 
So some key nutrients to support a woman's pregnancy journey include unsaturated fats, folate, lutein, and zeaxanthin, vitamin A, choline, and iron. And I'm just going to go into each of those briefly. So for unsaturated fats, both mono and polyunsaturated fats, also known as MUFAs and PUFAs, are important. They are necessary for structural and functional brain development. And MUFAs in particular make up a large portion of an infant's blood fatty acid profile. Folate is the best known nutrient for preventing neural tube defects and some heart defects as well. Lutein and zeaxanthin are carotenoids that are critical for proper eye development in utero, especially in the third trimester. And if breastfeeding is the feeding method, lutein is preferentially incorporated into breast milk, despite not being one of the predominant carotenoids consumed in the diet. It represents roughly 25% of the carotenoids in breast milk during the first few days of breastfeeding and increases to nearly 50% by the end of the first month. Vitamin A is an important antioxidant with a range of functions involving eye health, immune function, and neurological development. Vitamin A needs, needs increase during pregnancy for fetal growth and tissue maintenance and to support mom's metabolism. Now, choline has gotten more attention in recent years, but about 90 to 95% of pregnant women do not meet recommended intakes. That's huge. Choline plays an important role in modulating gene expression, cell membrane signaling, lipid transport and metabolism, and early brain development. Iron needs are 50% greater during pregnancy since the body uses iron to make hemoglobin, a protein that helps carry oxygen from your lungs to the rest of the body. The body needs extra iron to make more blood so that it can carry oxygen to the baby. And since we know that we eat foods and not nutrients, let's take a look at what foods should be considered to cover these nutrients these nutrient needs. They, there are many options. So when working with patients and clients, it's important to identify foods they enjoy and that are also accessible to them. So some sources of unsaturated fats include fresh avocado, fatty fish, nuts, seeds, and oils. Good sources of folate or avocado, dark leafy greens, asparagus, broccoli, oranges, beans, peas, Brussels sprouts, and beef liver. For lutein and zeaxanthin, uh, sources include avocado, leafy greens, and egg yolks. And lutein is fat soluble, so consuming it through avocado is beneficial because avocado contains the unsaturated fats that help with absorption. For vitamin A, if you're we're talking about the pro vitamin A, uh, sources include carrots, tomatoes, sweet potato, and dark leafy greens. And then for preform vitamin A, sources include dairy products, fish, eggs, and beef liver. Good sources of choline are meat. Uh, poultry, fish, and dairy products, as well as eggs. And then for iron, good sources include meat, seafood, nuts, beans, leafy greens, potatoes, and fortified grains like bread and cereal and pasta. And as you probably know, absorption of iron from plant-based foods like nuts and beans and grains is lower than from meat and seafood. So vitamin C from fruits and vegetables like citrus and strawberries, bell peppers, avocado, they can help with enhancing the absorption of iron from plant-based sources. Nutrition is one of the most important factors when determining the foods to feed an infant or toddler. And during this life stage, babies and toddlers consume small amounts of food. So it's really important to emphasize nutrient dense foods to make every bite count. And side note, this is actually a picture of my son Gideon, who is six now. Uh, but in this photo, he was about six months old and avocado was actually his third food that he tried and he absolutely loved it. So now let's talk about the nutrition considerations for birth to 24 months. So these are the nutrients we wanna think about. Um, so first human milk or iron fortified formula provides the bulk of nutrition for um, babies and infants. Then there's fat, fiber, protein, iron, zinc, beta carotene, lutein, and zeaxanthin. So I wanna just go into each one of those briefly too. So for human um, breast milk or iron fortified formula, uh, several public health organizations advocate for breastfeeding during the first six months of life with the transition to a combination of breastfeeding and complementary foods from six months to at least 12 months of age. Iron fortified infant formula is a great alternative and meets the nutrient needs of infants. And as healthcare providers, we can really empower our patients and clients to choose the feeding method that works best for them. 
For fat, infants, need, infants can meet dietary fat needs through human milk or formula. In infancy, research recommends that dietary fat comprise about 55% of energy intake to provide adequate energy for rapid growth, as well as the essential fatty acids for brain development. Specifically, monounsaturated fatty acids have been shown to be important for normal growth and development of the central nervous system and brain, as well as beneficial for fat-soluble nutrient absorption. Uh, currently, there is no in infant adequate intake established for fiber, but for children ages one to three, the adequate intake of fiber is 19 grams per day. Now, only 10% or less of adults consume the recommended amount of fiber, so there are absolutely benefits to establishing this habit early in life. Protein requirements during infancy when rapid growth is happening are higher per kilogram of body weight than those for older children or adults. And as far as in iron goes, infants are typically born with body stores of iron, but need to start consuming foods like meat, seafood, and iron fortified cereals from age six through 11 months. Iron supports neurologic development and immune function. Zinc supports growth and immune function. And for those that are breastfeeding, human milk provides adequate amounts of zinc until baby is about six months old. For that reason, it's recommended to introduce zinc-rich foods like meats, beans, and zinc-fortified infant cereals starting around six months. For beta-carotene, lutein, and zeaxanthin, they are carotenoids, which have an impact on healthy growth and development, including brain health. So we've reviewed some of the sources on a previous slide. Uh, and once again, you'll see avocados are a source of several of these important nutrients. We've already talked about sources of healthy, unsaturated fats and iron. So let's just take a moment to review the sources of some of the other nutrients that are important for this life stage. So for fiber, some great sources include avocado, pears, apples, legumes, and grains. For protein, you can get that through meat, poultry, seafood, beans, and lentils. And then for zinc, you can uh, obtain that from fortified cereal, meat, beans, seafood, and seeds. And then good sources of beta carotene, lutein, and zeaxanthin include avocados, carrots, egg yolks, and leafy greens. So starting around four to six months is when it's appropriate to start introducing complementary foods to infants once they've developed the gross motor, oral, and fine motor skills that are necessary. And during this time, it's recommended that a variety of foods from all groups be introduced to support nutrient adequacy, foster acceptance of healthy foods, and set intakes on a path toward a healthy pattern. As an infant's oral skills develop, the thickness and texture of food can gradually be varied, and avocados are an ideal first food for babies because their smooth consistency and texture, they can be pureed, mashed, sliced, or removed. their mild, neutral flavor is neither sweet, bitter, nor salty. They also contain several key nutrients for health and development, including fiber, unsaturated fatty acids, more than 20 vitamins and minerals, and an array of phytonutrients. Because very young children are being exposed to new textures and flavors for the first time, it may take multiple exposures for an infant to accept a new type of food. Repeated offering of foods such as fruits and vegetables increases the likelihood of an infant accepting them. So now that um, I've covered that part, I'm going to turn things over to Christy, who's going to talk about the next life stage. Thank you, Jackie. Um, now that Jackie set us up so beautifully for prenatal nutrition and the and infancy, I'm going to move into childhood and adolescence. Many transitions take place during childhood and adolescence. Physical, emotional, and mental changes create a desire for independence, and children and adolescents are increasingly influenced by media and their peers. I can certainly attest to this. I have a six and eight year old. As many parents can probably relate, this presents unique and evolving opportunities and challenges related to healthy eating. Beginning in early childhood, dietary habits that are established set the stage for eating patterns that will impact health throughout the lifetime. Aside from promoting healthy growth and development, healthy eating patterns during this life stage can help reduce the risk of developing high blood pressure, high cholesterol, impaired glucose tolerance, heart disease, and type 2 diabetes later in life. 
Establishing healthy eating patterns at a young age involves both emphasizing nutrient-dense foods and these foods making up the foundation of the diet, but also modeling and encouraging a positive relationship with all foods, which we'll get into a little bit more as we go on. From the standpoint of meeting nutrient needs during this lifespan, a few key things for our patients to focus on when supporting healthy choices for their children and adolescents include number one, emphasizing a variety of foods, including nutrient dense options, such as fruits and vegetables, whole grains, variety of protein sources, and dairy. Snacks are an ideal opportunity to promote consumption of nutrient dense foods especially during early childhood when the total volume of food consumed at mealtimes is lower than when children are older. Then into adolescence, snacking can be a good strategy to meeting increased calorie and nutrient needs. Fat, fiber, and protein are all nutrients that promote satiety and help us stay full, as we know, and satisfied for longer, which is so important for growing kids. Some ideal snack pairings could be a slice of whole grain toast, which provides fiber, topped with mashed avocado, giving you the fat and fiber, and some fun seasoning of your choice. And I'm going to give you some suggestions for seasonings towards the end of the presentation. Another example could be whole grain crackers, again, a source of fiber with some guacamole for dipping, delivering both fat and fiber again from the avocado, and some sliced veggies, more fiber. Or say a cheese stick, delivering fat and protein along with a piece of fruit fiber. Again, we love our fiber. We know as dietitians, uh, we're always talking about fiber, uh, but really that combination of fat and fiber and protein is so important. Third, putting an emphasis on good unsaturated fats can help lay the foundation for optimal dietary fat intake. About 80% of children and adolescents exceed the recommended intake of saturated fat and this pattern tends to continue into adulthood with more than 70% of adults consuming too much saturated fat. A simple way to limit saturated fats to focus on sources of unsaturated fats in place of these saturated fats. Avocados are virtually the only fruit with unsaturated fats and can play a dual role in meeting both fruit and good fat recommendations. So they're you know, special for that unique reason. And then lastly, supporting healthy behaviors around added sugars. So while added sugars are not necessary from a nutrient perspective, I don't think anyone can argue that these foods often play a role in celebrations and traditions providing both joy and satisfaction. And some research suggests it's important to not overly restrict our kids from sweets, showing that restriction may actually contribute to disordered relationships with sugar, sweets, and desserts later in life. Including sweets at mealtimes and not limiting sweets to just those special occasions can help to normalize sweets and may reduce the risk of this disordered eating later in life. So just keep that in mind, and we're not going to delve too much into that, um, but you know that is an area of intuitive eating uh, that we're also going to be um, covering later on in this presentation. Research shows that on average, fruit and vegetable intake starts to fall below the recommended levels beginning at age five and continuing through childhood, adolescence, and beyond. We can really help parents encourage fruit and vegetable consumption and foster a preference for these foods in their children at a young age to ensure adequate intakes later in life. Consumption of fruits and vegetables in early childhood has been associated with lower blood pressure in adolescents, and lower risk of stroke, and lower risk of some cancers in adulthood. By late adolescence, fruit and vegetable intake is about half of what is recommended on average, and suboptimal consumption typically persists into adulthood. And we've all heard this before, that we're not meeting the recommendations, but this really shows you how big the gap is and how it only increases during adolescence uh, and into those teen years. And speaking of fruit and vegetable consumption, research shows that consumption can support better diet quality in adolescence. We like to share an observation study supported by the Avocado Nutrition Center. In a, in, in a study of 534 adolescents, Researchers found that avocado consumption was associated with better diet quality, 
including higher intakes of fruits, vegetables, dietary fiber, and several vitamins and minerals. They found that eating avocado was not associated with body weight, body composition, or waist circumference. And that by adding just one nutrient dense food to the diet, you can really make a difference in overall diet quality. And adding one food at a time can start to build this foundation of a healthy eating pattern. As we know, all studies come with some limitations. Since this was an observational study, the findings do not show cause and effect, and more research is needed to generalize the results to larger, more diverse populations. Now we've talked a lot about nutrition considerations during these different life stages, and I wanna take a mi minute to emphasize behavioral considerations since this is the driving force of developing ha um, healthy eating patterns. So there are opportunities all along the growth continuum for exposure to a variety of foods, particularly nutrient dense foods that we want kids to have a preference for. Starting with prenatal nutrition, as Jackie covered, uh, when the baby is growing, it is influenced by what the mom is eating. Babies start learning about flavor before they're even born. Many of the flavors that mothers eat are transmitted into their amniotic fluid, and this is how babies are exposed to this variety of flavors, even you know, in, the, in utero, excuse me, in utero. Now during birth to 24 months, babies have an opportunity to experience a variety of foods and flavors, and this can impact their future taste preferences, food choices, and overall health. Whether a baby is breastfed or formula fed, they have an opportunity to experience different flavors during this time. When it comes to introducing solids, the practice of repeated exposure to food can help increase the acceptance of the food. For instance, a baby's rejection of bitter taste is innate, so they need experience with bitter taste through more exposures to enhance their acceptance. We're not born liking the taste of bitter foods as we are sweet foods. Children's eating patterns often resemble those of their household, making it important for parents or caregivers to model healthy eating behaviors and include nutrient-dense foods as a regular part of family meal times. In fact, research shows modeling is such an important practice in influencing child's diet quality. And it's also just as important to model and discuss how all foods fit to help develop a healthy relationship with food in general, as I touched on earlier. Intuitive eating experts strongly advocate neutralizing all foods to reduce the risk of disordered eating and over restriction later in life. For example, an intuitive eating expert may recommend serving a cookie alongside a nutrient-dense meal, say one that includes avocado, rather than telling a child they need to eat the nutrient-dense meal or eat the avocado before getting the cookie. There's certainly a lot of nuance to this, but we feel it's important to mention this. Sharing meals with your child and modeling healthy eating behaviors and practices helps them to observe and learn these beneficial behaviors. Family meal times are an opportunity for a repeated exposure of new foods and to make these nutrient dense foods a regular occurrence. Um, we know childhood and adolescence is marked by increased desire for independence. So involving children and adolescents in grocery shopping and cooking and meal selection can help them feel more empowered in their food choices and help them foster these healthy habits and relationships with foods. One approach that always resonated with me when I, that I just wanted to share because it it always stuck with me uh, when I was first introducing solids to my children was the division of responsibilities between parent and child at the table. It is the parent's job to offer the food and the child's job to decide what and how much to eat. And this principle is based on the renowned child feeding expert, Ellen Satter. I'm happy to drop a link in the chat box or to provide more resources after the webinar if you're interested in this, in this feeding concept. Establishing healthy eating behaviors early can impact the health and well being of the family. And in fact, there was a randomized control trial also supported by the Avocado Nutrition Center, in which researchers explored how integrating avocados into the diet of Hispanic and Latino families would impact family level nutritional status and cardiometabolic risk factors. So, in this study, 72 families received either three avocados per week 
or 14 avocados per week. Families in both intervention groups receive nutrition education and avocados over a six month period. The goal was to provide the participating families with tools and tips to improve diet quality and meet nutritional goals, yet not individually counseling them on energy restriction or elimination of any foods. And it, just to note, high consumers of avocados were excluded from the study. So if they were already consuming a lot of avocado, they were excluded. So what did the results show? That compared to the low avocado allotment group, the ones that were, were receiving three avocados per week, the high avocado allotment group had a significant reduction in caloric intake, saturated fat, and sodium, as well as dairy, refined grains, and red and processed meats. And neither group experienced changes in body weight, BMI, or waist circumference, despite the added calories from the addition of avocados. As with all studies, we must consider limitations. For this study, that includes drawbacks of all validated food frequency questionnaires, which prevent the generalization of the findings. However, the, these findings are a good example of how a culturally traditional food that is already well-loved can be used as a way to build healthy eating patterns. Again, a good reminder of the importance of discovering nutritious foods that our clients already love and working within those preferences to create more healthy habits. And like we mentioned before, establishing healthy eating patterns can also influence other positive lifestyle changes, somewhat creating a ripple effect. Another study involving the same 72 Hispanic and Latino families from the previous study found that higher allocation of avocados was associated with significantly higher physical activity and no adverse changes in BMI or blood pressure. These findings provide evidence suggesting that just one healthy eating behavior can lead to other healthy behaviors and how just one change can jumpstart our clients and lay a foundation for other positive behaviors. Now, the benefits of eating meals together as a family cannot be underscored enough. We have to acknowledge families are busy and may not be able to sit down together every night or meal each day. Um, but any time together is valuable time. You can work with your patients to identify how they can prioritize this time, even if it's only for a couple of days a week. Any time is, is valuable. Leveraging mealtime as a way to bring the family together is just one way to support healthy behaviors. Not only can you use the time to introduce new foods, but also to reconnect as a family and create memories. Research has looked at the impact of frequent family meals, and studies have found that Children who have more frequent family meals have, may have better dietary health and behavioral outcomes. Additionally, creating quality time between family members can support in development and provide opportunities for communication and family bonding to create more trusted relationships. And now we're going to be moving into our cooking demo. Um, and Jackie and I are each going to be demonstrating two simple recipes that are family friendly. Um, we're so excited to share these kid-friendly avocado recipes with you. And the first one we'll be making is an avocado, apple, and banana mashup that I'm going to turn over to Jackie to demonstrate. And um, the recipes have been sent out over email, and I'll also drop them in the chat box again. Feel free to put in any questions you have in the chat box as well, and we'll get to them at the end. All right, everyone, I'm going to show you how to make this delicious avocado banana apple mashup. And this recipe is really perfect to whip together for a quick and nutrient dense meal for your little one. And it can also be adjusted to include other fruits and vegetables too. And like we mentioned, avocados are a great first food to introduce to infants, um, not only because they contain nutrients such as unsaturated fats and fiber, but they also have a very mild flavor and they can be mashed into a creamy texture, uh, which can really help avoid any chances of choking. So first I'm going to just walk you through what I did with the apple. So I peeled the apple, and then um, it's a red apple. I used a gala apple today. And then I just boiled it with a little bit of water for about 10 minutes so that it was nice and soft. So I'm gonna put that in my little mini food processor. This is a great little kitchen um, item because it's really not intimidating. So if you have some older children who are helping you, it's really wonderful because 
Um, it's just not really intimidating. Uh, it's not as intimidating as like a really big food processor or blender. It's nice and small for them. So we're going to put that in and then we're going to add in our avocado. So first I want to talk about even how to select an avocado. So it should have a really nice dark, dark color like this. And then when you press it, it should have a little give. And that's when you know that it's nice and ripe. So I'm going to show you how to cut it. So you want to put it on your cutting board. Make sure your cutting board is nice and stable. I have a wet paper towel under mine. And then you can cut into it. So using a very sharp knife, you're going to cut into it. Your knife will cut the pit. And then you're going to just go all the way around and you'll be able to cut it. And then beautiful avocado right here. Now to get out the avocado, you wanna also do this carefully. So you can use your spoon very easily to get out one half, no problem there. I'll just break this up into quarters so that, um, it's a little easier for my, for my food processor. And then to get the pit out, what we recommend is that you either push the pit out or use your spoon to scoop it out. And this is, again, this is like a fun little task for an older child to help with. So then again, I'm gonna scoop my avocado right out. And then I'm going to put that into my food processor. And then lastly, I'm going to add in a ripe banana you can see the spots on there so it's nice and sweet and that's going to be a great way for them to get just like a hint of sweetness into this recipe and then we are going to blend it up now what you could do as well um, you could certainly add in some spices um, and that's a really great way of introducing them to new flavors so you could add in cinnamon or ginger those would be great additions you could also swap out the apple for a different fruit if you want to use maybe something like peach or mango. That would also go very, very well in this. So I'm just going to blend this up real quick. You can use your spatula to just help your blender out a little bit. I'm just gonna break up these pieces of, of uh, banana and that'll get it moving. Okay, and that's it, we are done. So this is what it looks like. Let me open it up. And it's beautiful green color. So what you could do is you can serve a little bit to your baby and then anything that you have left over, you could put in a silicone tray like this. Let me just grab it. So this is a wonderful little kitchen item to also get. This is a silicone tray that you can freeze. So you can portion out any leftovers that you have and freeze it. Now, my kids are a little older. I'm not, I'm not using purees anymore, uh, but you can absolutely use this when they're older too. So if you have any leftover mashed avocado, you can totally freeze it and then you can pop it into smoothies or dips as you need it. So I love this um, and it is awesome. Another way to serve the puree to um, a little bit of an older child or even an infant, you could put it into a popsicle mold. So this is what it looks like. Super cute. Um, these are uh, a little bit of a larger popsicle, so you can get a slightly smaller popsicle tray if you're serving it to a baby. So with both my kids, I did a combination of purees and baby led weaning. So baby led weaning, you're giving your child a chunk of food, like a, a piece of an avocado. So if I were to do that, I would create a strip and I'm just gonna show you real quick what I would serve. So I would give them a piece like this. I would take the skin off. And then to make it a little easier for baby to hold, you can actually coat it with a little bit of rice cereal or um, hemp seeds. I actually saw somebody put that in the chat box. And yes, that's another great way to help them grip it. And they're also getting a little added boost of nutrition too. So this is about the serving um, and size that I would give to um, an infant who's ready to have solids. Um, they have to be developmentally ready for something like that. So 
you can do um, a combination and that's great. Um, and uh, I think I will pass things back to Christy now. So hope you enjoy the recipe. And yeah, this is a wonderful recipe, not just for little kiddos. I will be enjoying this uh, when we're done with the webinar. <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. And there's um, a question in the chat box that you may want to answer about your food processor. Oh, sure. No problem. Yeah, Marcia is curious about that. Um, and then we've seen some questions come in about freezing and ripening. So uh, before I start my demo, I'll just address the, the ripening one. So the best way to ripen an unripe avocado is to put it in a brown paper bag along with an apple or banana because of the natural ethylene gas that comes off um, that helps speed up ripening. So you can do this for two to three days until it's ripe. And then, you know, once it is ripe, if you want a slow ripening, if you're not going to be using it right away, just stick it in the refrigerator. It will still ripen, but it's going to ripen much more slowly and uh, will extend the shelf life for you. Um, this oxidation, the oxidation process or browning, there was also a question about that and whether when you freeze, um, you know, the puree, whether it stops the browning or not. Yeah, these are, I mean, as you can see, it's perfectly bright green, just like my mash. Um, I mean, if you let it sit out for a while, it would start to oxidize as, you know, would anything, um, but it, it doesn't turn brown in the freezer at all. It, it keeps its nice bright green color. Um, and if you're not freezing it, you can just rub the, like say you make you know an avocado mash and you wanna store it in the refrigerator, it does start to brown from the oxidation, but you can squeeze or rub a little lemon or lime juice on the top. And then also I like to cover it really tightly with plastic wrap, like directly in contact you know, with the avocado so that um, you remove, you know, the exposure to oxygen. Um, just keep in mind with storage of avocados, um, there was a viral trend about storing them in water. You do not want to do that. So you don't want to store water, um, avocados in water to, um, to prolong shelf life. So I just replaced the spotlight here since I'm going to be moving into my demo. Um, you you don't want to do that. You don't want to store the avocados in water, really any kind of um, produce like that. It can really increase the risk of foodborne illness. So um, don't listen to the TikTok trend. Um, and, you know, any kind of pathogens like listeria or salmonella can that are, exist on the fruit's exterior can really multiply when submerged in water. So um, just keep them out on the counter in a brown paper bag or in your refrigerator. Okay, now I'm gonna be moving into the demo for these avocado um, banana muffins, banana berry muffins, and I'm gonna be using a blender. So this is a different kind of muffin method than you might be used to. So instead of whisking ingredients or using a handheld blender, um, I'm actually going to be using a high-speed blender um, because it includes oats and I'm going to be making essentially an oat flour. So I'm going to show you here. I'm going to start adding. I have my ingredients already measured out. So first I'm going to add two cups of rolled oats. Any kind of rolled oats are fine. And then I'm going to add I'll see, let me do this in the order of the recipe that you all have in front of you. Um, adding two large eggs. And if you wanted to make this recipe gluten-free, just use certified gluten-free oats. So there aren't any other sources of gluten other than uh, if you have celiac, you know, to make sure that the oats are certified gluten-free. Then we have a half of a ripe avocado. So that's pitted, no peel on, of course. Um, it needs to be ripe. It's important because we, we need to blend this. So we don't want any hard chunks of avocado in our muffin. So we need it to be nice and ripe. Then one ripe banana. And the avocado here in combination um, with the banana really gives a creamy consistency and is a good replacement for 
butter that you might use in a muffin. So the, the banana is a little bit brown, but that's actually a good thing to point out. If you have an avocado or a banana that's a little bit overripe, you can go ahead and, um, and use it in a muffin batter. That's a good way to, to use it instead of throwing it out as it's going bad. Uh, not going bad, but over ripening. Then we have a half a cup of applesauce. So again, this is a common replacement for a source of saturated fat like butter. And then we have some other ingredients I'm gonna pull over here. We have our sweetener, we have maple syrup, vanilla extract, and then um, our dry ingredients. So I'm going to add a quarter cup of maple syrup. And you can use another sweetener if you want, such as agave, um, if you wanted a neutral sweetener, but just remember to not use honey for the first year of life, because that's um, for food safety, that's not recommended for babies. And then we have, I have here in this little bowl, one teaspoon of baking powder, half a teaspoon of baking soda, and a quarter teaspoon of salt. Lastly, one teaspoon of vanilla extract. And now this is going to go in my blender. Let me move this over here so you can see it. it might get loud for a moment, but luckily Zoom quiets it down for us. So I'll stop that for a minute, just so you can see what it looks like. It's so we need to blend it until smooth. It has, it, I'm going to blend it just another moment because I see some whole oats still left in here. Okay, so now, now is the point where I'm going to add the berries. This is a great recipe for, to do with your children. So when you're first starting out involving your kids in the kitchen, um, you can just start by, I think cracking an egg was one of the first things that I did with my kids. Um, you know, have teaching them how to crack an egg, it's, it's really fun because it's, a little bit messy and kids love, you know, getting messy when they're that age. And it's, it's important to be okay with that when you're cooking with your kids. Um, they can help you measure ingredients, add them to the blender. They can help, you know, as long as you're careful pressing the button to turn the blender on. Um, they can help scoop out the avocado. If you have a really little one, you know, I used to put my, um, my kids in the high chair and kind of watch me give them like a piece of avocado and banana so that they're still involved in what I'm doing, even if they're not actually, you know, standing next to me preparing it. So now I'm going to add half of our blueberries. So I'm in Maine, so I have wild blueberries. So I'm going to add half, so about a half a cup of blueberries. And I'm just going, and these have some liquid in them because they were frozen, so that's fine. I'm going to add that and just stir it in. So this batter is gonna, and you can use fresh whole blueberries, but this batter is gonna turn a little bit purple um, and bluish from the frozen blueberries. And my oven's preheated to 400 degrees. So then I'll show you how to divide these up and put them in the oven. And then I'll show you what they look like when they come out. This is also something kids can help you with. So. I just, I have some lightly greased um, muffin cup liners just so that they pop out even more easily. So then just pour it about two thirds of the way up. 
I won't do all of these for just for the sake of time, but just to show you how high to fill them up. And then, so I would keep going and then I'll show you how to just top them with the remaining blueberries. So, so this is all something your kids can help you with. So then I would have the remaining blueberries and just top them on top and then press them down slightly. Doesn't have to be you know, perfectly evenly distributed, but just press them down into the batter a little bit. And then these go into the oven for 15 to 18 minutes and until a toothpick comes out clean. And then they look like this. Um, and they're, they're really, really delicious. <laughs> um, and these can be great, you know, made in advance and even frozen. Um, it's good to kind of make the beginning of the week and then have uh, as a snack in your kids' lunches or as a, you know, quick snack from home. And so now, oh, you want, Susan wants me to open one up to see the inside. Sure, of course. <laughs> And you get a good look at that. So you can see there's no pieces of, of oats uh, because we blended everything up. Uh, and it's a little bit, you know, naturally sweet from the banana and from the berries. And then, of course, and the vanilla extract also helps. And then, of course, you have a little bit of maple syrup. I would put them so they don't get freezer burned. There's a question about how to store them in the freezer. Um, I would keep them, you know, as tightly sealed as you can. And yes, they would be fine for six months. I mean, really just the quality, if there's any exposure to air, they might get a little freezer burned over time. And now I'm going to, oh, I, um, there's a question about the what I put in the bottom. You don't have to line the muffin, um, the muffin cup liners, but the recipe suggests grease, lightly greasing them so that the muffins come out even more, um, you know, not stuck to the to the muffin cup liner. You could use oat flour. I haven't measured it with oat flour. I was wondering that myself, like exactly. It would probably yield a little bit less um, once the oats are ground. So I would use a little bit less oat flour, uh, maybe maybe a cup and a half. And the temperature and time was 400 degrees for 15 minutes, 15 to 18 minutes uh, on the middle rack. And I'm gonna go in before we wrap up, um, if we could just see, the slides again. I'm going to go through some flavor pairings for you. Great, thank you. So now before we wrap up, we want to leave you with some suggested flavor pairings for your own recipe development inspiration. So recipes are wonderful. We all do rely on them, but it's also good to just experiment in the kitchen and you know not uh, rely on not always measuring every single ingredient out and feeling the confidence to put together recipe combinations of your own. And I saw some great suggestions in the chat box already that touches on some of these recommendations. So on the left, you'll see that we've broken these down by five taste elements, sour, salty, sweet, bitter, and umami, the savory taste. And on the right, we've included some suggestions for spices, aromatics, and condiments that pair especially well with avocado. You can see avocado can really be a vehicle for so many different tastes and textures, which is important to keep in mind when introducing solid foods and advancing through different feeding stages. So one problem, you know, with a lot of those pouches of ready-made baby foods on the market is that they're just all one texture. So it's really, and that can, you know, contribute to um, picky eating and kids just getting used to things always being smooth and pureed. So we really want to advance those textures as kids get older and as they're able to um, to handle, you know, different textures. So avocado provides this opportunity, expands kids' palates to explore global flavors and a range of textures. It can be a great binder um, if you want to mix in some grains. It can be, you know, um, to add, add the grains for, the grains can add more texture, or you can experiment with some spices, herbs and spices listed here. 
So pairing strong flavors such as onion and garlic or smoked paprika with a mild flavor of avocado increase, can increase the likelihood of acceptability. Or on the other hand, if a child may not be a huge fan of avocado at first, adding a sprinkle of flaky sea salt or everything seasoning or a squeeze of lime may make it even tastier for them to enjoy. I know we need to be mindful of sodium in the early years, but a tiny pinch of salt can really go a long way. I want to encourage you to just you know, think about um, making the foods as you would enjoy it. And, you know, children will respond to that as well. Can really, salt can bring out the flavor in both fruits, both fruits and vegetables. So, you know, if you're serving avocado and at first, um, you know, your child doesn't like it, maybe adding a little pinch of salt and some lime might make the world of difference to them. Someone wanted me to, to read, um, everything on that slide, but just for the nature of uh, respect for time, we're just gonna be moving on and you'll receive the all of the slides you'll have access to, to refer back to. Now that we've reviewed the different single ingredients that can be complementary to avocado, here's some recipe ideas that don't necessarily require actual recipes, as I said, with precise measurements, but can provide suggestions for how to incorporate some of the items from the previous slide in easy ways. So for example, a quick crema for an, a taco, you can make, or, or for beans and rice, say on the side, you can mix avocado yogurt mashed or pureed with yogurt, um, excuse me, with lime juice and a pinch of salt. You can make avocado toast. We all love avocado toast. It's still, um, I know it was a trend for a while, but it's still one of my go-to quick meals for any time of day. You can have a toaster bread, mashed avocado uh, with some everything seasoning, lemon juice, and top it with a fried egg. Um, you can make dressings out of it. You can add avocados to green salads, make them and make a smoothie. Um, pair, they pair so well with citrus. So you know, really year round, if you think about all the different seasonal fruits and vegetables, there's a way to pair, pair it with them year round. And this nutrient-dense food fruit is so versatile. Here are some other ways that you can incorporate avocado into your kitchen with some specific recipe inspiration um, from, um, from the website that, that you're we're able to give you access to um, at the end of the webinar. So there's even chocolate pudding. If you haven't tried that, um, don't knock it till you try it. Avocado actually works beautifully in chocolate pudding um, or a mousse smoothie bowls, or even um, egg donuts with some avocado. Making fun recipes like this is such an easy way to get the whole family involved in the kitchen. So we just wanted to end with some key takeaways for you. Again, the development of healthy habits starts early and really lays the foundation of future behaviors. You can help patients identify and incorporate a variety of nutrient-dense food that fill these nutrient needs throughout all life stages. Um, and just keep in mind that this gap in fruit and vegetable consumption continues to grow. So you might have you know, a lot in the beginning, but then it grows as kids age. So just keep continuing to think of ways to look, minute, reduce that gap as they age is important. Small shifts matter. So remember that positive, you know, just adding one nutrient dense food can really lead to other positive um, choices later on and that kids learn from their surroundings. So cultivating healthy habits as a family and, you know, whoever and their caretakers is so important through parent modeling and, and developing that healthy relationship with all foods. And then empowering patients with culinary strategies. So it's great to talk about how wonderful a food is, but if they don't understand how to incorporate it, and that's what our mission is all about, then, you know, it's going to be really hard for them to make that, incorporate that change and that food into their diets. So with that, um, we're coming to an end. We'll have a few minutes for questions. We just want you to bookmark this in your calendar, save the date um, and register now if you're if you're able to, to for part two of this series, which will go into the next life stage, establishing and sustaining healthy habits throughout adulthood with fresh avocado. And that will be September 19th, same time. And now we'll take a few questions.
Okay, I've been collecting them. <laughs> so um, one of the questions, I think this is when I was doing my cooking demo, uh, Susan asked um, what might provide some protein and you could totally add some yogurt um, or even cottage cheese um, into this mashup and it would be great. And then you'd get a little added boost of protein. Um, Another person asked um, for suggestions for what can be added to the final product to create a non-mashed texture for people who have issues with smooth textures. And depending on the age of the person, if we're talking about maybe um, a, a child, um, not an infant, um, you could certainly make like a salsa. You could, you know, chop up some um, of the apple with the avocado. Um, you could put the banana in, but maybe you could do another fruit like mango and make a salsa with that and it would be really good, uh, a fruit-based salsa. Um, another question was um, for a vegan version, could you, of, of your, of the muffins, mm -hmm. um, could you use um, something like flax eggs or something else? Yeah, I haven't done it, but I would say a, a flax egg could work. Um, Jackie, you're actually better at answering this because you do more vegan baking. I totally, than I, I, I totally imagine it would work. I haven't tested it with that, but um, I'm sure it would be fine. Um, and then Mary asks, is it okay to use overripe avocados? Like the brown spots, should you cut it off? And I mean, it's fine. It's just bruised. You know, it's just like how a banana might get a little bruised. It's totally fine. The nutrients are there. Um, so totally use it. And especially in something like, um, you know, the muffins where it's being blended in or the mashup, mm -hmm. it's being combined with other things. Totally fine. It'll be disguised if there's that, you know, little bit of brown. So yeah, no I would say the only, if it's, you know, yellow or looks really stringy or is, you know, black or something like that, if it just looks off or smells, then if it's, if it's bad, of course, don't use it if it doesn't, but just for the brown, that's fine. And um, Alina asks, what would you recommend as an alternative for applesauce? She has everything to make the muffins today and she wants to make them. <laughs> I would probably just add a little more avocado um, or maybe some yogurt. I'm trying to think like not, not necessarily Greek yogurt, but regular yogurt or a little bit of, well, applesauce is usually like a butter replacement. Or banana, maybe. Or banana, yeah. yeah. Um, I would probably add more of the avocado and banana and then let us know how it turns out you might need yeah because the applesauce adds a little bit of sweetness so um you know you might want to just adjust you know taste well you can't really you're not supposed to taste it with raw egg but um <laughs> just i think keep that in mind when you're making your substitution and just one last question because we're right at two o'clock now um could you use oat flour and i'm sure yeah i saw that question so i would just i i'm you definitely could I'm just not exactly sure of the ratio because I haven't done the conversion, but I know it would be a little bit less oat flour. So just look at the consistency. Um, so don't add the full, don't add two cups. So just start with less and then adjust based on the consistency to make sure it's, um, you know, kind of like pancake batter, muffin batter, where you can pour it out of the blender, yeah. but not too thin. Um, and I just want to read one comment that um, a participant just put in the chat. Um, Eleonora wrote that words that you use for describing foods is critical when working with children. And I couldn't agree more with that. Um, I've taught plenty of kids classes and it is really true. You really have to name a recipe in a way that's really inviting to kids. So, you know, I might call this like a green monster mashup, you know, um, or something like that, you know, use words that are like exciting and kid friendly, and that might help entice them to try the recipe. So great point. Thank you, Eleanor, for putting that in the chat box. Um, I think, yes. uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I just, and I think at this age, especially uh, just because I, I pay a lot of attention to, you know, the recommendations from, like I said, the intuitive eating experts and other pediatric dietitians to to really not focus on the nutrition as, you know, so much at this age, um, but just really to encourage, uh, talk about the flavors and textures. And like Jackie said, using those that creative words and just get them involved in the kitchen um, and just get them excited about food in general, you know, and not um, focus so much on, you know, 
what it's doing for their bodies at this young age, at least in early, you know, their very early years. When you get into adolescence, you know, the teenage years, that's different. They'll probably have more interest in that. But, um, yeah. you know, to not label good and bad foods, as we know, and um, just to get them, you know, excited and interested in cooking with you and in trying different foods. Yeah. Well, this marks the end of our uh, the continuing education portion of the webinar.